Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, my role is as Executive Secretary of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Uh, I'm based with the GBF Secretariat in Copenhagen. Uh, and as I say, it's a great pleasure to be here. Following from the last two presentations, I'd like to, to start just by putting in context the things that I want to talk about. And really, uh, my interest is very much around how we can integrate knowledge and data in order to be more efficient uh, and more capable at addressing some of the big questions that we would really like to address. And in particular, uh, in regard to biodiversity, the range of plants, animals, microorganisms uh, around the world, um, I have two big integrative questions I would like to be able to consider. The first of those is the challenge that uh, has already taken more than 250 years for us to work on and we're still far from complete and that is describing the world's plant and animal species, even just putting names on all of them. Uh, and this is an activity which has been a long-running collaborative international scientific effort but where the work has largely been based on published materials in the literature and some very complicated processes around naming to try to deal with all of the unexpected things that might happen when people publish species descriptions asynchronously and then deal together with cleaning that information up. And I believe that one of the things we should be trying to do is put all of this information much more into a linked open data space that allows us to build continuously and improve that knowledge and effectively have something that continuously dynamically uh, improves over time. The second uh, and probably bigger, but in some ways easier, uh, integrative challenge is around the concept of biodiversity itself. And I'll say a bit more on this in my presentation than I do about the first of these challenges. But really here, I'm thinking of biodiversity as the, the set of species uh, that occur within a particular place, like uh, here in this, this area on the coast of Western Australia, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an, a euro, uh, kind of kangaroo, very obvious, there's all these plants, there's presumably lots of insects feeding on those plants, there's fungi affecting those plants, uh, and those are going to be very different to the ones that we would find here in Ile de France or uh, in the area of Copenhagen, around Copenhagen where I'm living, how do those things differ? Which things are more prominent in some areas than others? Uh, and how's that changed over time? And that's all very well. This is very different from Western Europe, but uh, can we do the same sort of thing at a sufficiently fine scale that we could take that into account as part of our planning of land use and our consideration of how to balance all the complicated challenges that are represented, for example, by the Sustainable Development Goals. If we want a world where we can deal with food security, energy production, peace, gender equality, preservation of, of natural systems, we need the best possible information we can about how those trade-offs can be made. So GBIF uh, is an international intergovernmental partnership uh, as we, we saw in, in Bill's presentation, it's been in existence since 2001. Uh, it was in response to some OECD recommendations around uh, the need for uh, mega science facilities uh, for biological information. And our overall goal is to support free and open access to uh, biodiversity information, to support science, society and a sustainable future. And this sort of inverted waterfall on the right hand side is how I see GBIF fitting into uh, a, a series of layered international agreements and initiatives. Uh, GBIF exists to organize data uh, that can serve as an evidence base for uh, activities such as building a, an earth observing system of systems uh, under the umbrella of GEO and GEOBON and we'll hear more about these kinds of things when Dirk speaks later, uh, and that if we have sufficiently good uh, modelled representations of the patterns and changes in biodiversity, 
then that makes it easier for the kind of assessments we might want to carry out at the level of IPBES, uh, the Intergovernmental uh, Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, to be based on real evidence and real data and traceable, repeatable information rather than just expert opinion. Uh, and that can support governments operating, for example, through the Convention on Biological Diversity to be able to, uh, to be more accurate in their thinking and their planning. And ultimately, to help us deliver a world that uh, can achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which I, for one, really want. A fundamental concept in that is the idea of unifying Earth observations. Uh, and uh, GEO uh, has, as part of the overall concept for the, uh, its Earth Observing System of Systems, a focus on biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability as one of the societal benefit areas that needs to be addressed. Uh, and a, a whole network of uh, experts and institutions and agencies collaborating uh, as GEOBON, the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network, uh, in order to try and deliver uh, a solution to that space. Um, and as the, the fourth presentation today will address, uh, that group is focusing more and more on the idea of essential biodiversity variables, a response to uh, the success, for example, of the essential climate variables, and trying to uh, identify a manageable but informative set of uh, measures that uh, somehow characterize as fully as possible biodiversity and how it differs between different times and places. Now, I mentioned earlier this example of you know, comparing Australia to, um, uh, to, to France or, or Denmark uh, for biodiversity. But in my mind, it's easier, uh, at, least, at least if you're old enough to have seen changes. Um, but here, here is a representation of biodiversity on the east coast of the UK, as I remember it from 40 years ago when I was happily bird watching uh, around that area. I remember seeing lots of shorebirds, sandlings and other things, vast numbers of starlings. I certainly remember finding burnet moths uh, around the area where I was. I seem to recall, and uh, from my notebooks, I find I very often saw stoats and weasels running around chasing the many, many rabbits there were, uh, many of which were suffering from myxomatosis. Um, I remember excitement at finding my first pseudoscorpion. Um, and I have a picture of the relative abundance of the species that I grew up with. I sometimes visit the same area now. There are still shorebirds, but there seem to be many fewer. The numbers of starlings are tiny in comparison. I can't find any burnet moths. I haven't seen a live uh, stoat or weasel in a long time. I found this dead one. Uh, there's actually very few rabbits there now, although there are muntjac deer. Uh, I still can find the pseudoscorpions. And now there's a lot of southern species that have moved north, things like little egrets and chetty's warblers uh, that were just rare, rare, rare birds when I was young. Now, some of these things are a result of climate change. Some of them may be a result of changes in agricultural practices. Some of them may be a result of pesticides. Others may just be random stochastic variation. But for any place, we can see these patterns. We can see these changes. And the question is, could we organize the data we have available so that we could have some statistical confidence for different, different time periods in the same, same area or for different areas about how biodiversity is different. Which species are most common? Which ones are contributing most to the biomass? Uh, are the interactions between species, uh, so the, the food webs and the, the, uh, the way the whole ecosystem is structured similar between two places, or are there very different things happening at a functional level? At the most basic, uh, this means that we would like, for different times and places, to be able to organize a view of the set of species, the relative abundance that is found. And one of the things that GBIF is trying to do is really to organize the evidence we have to fill out this kind of grid. And I'm going to talk now about some of the things we're doing towards that end. First of all, GBIF, as I mentioned, is uh, an international, primarily intergovernmental partnership. All of our funding for our core activities comes from uh, contributions from national agencies. Uh, 
uh, in the, the countries that are, are colored green here. Those that are blue are associate countries that have uh, committed to open data access through GBIF, but where uh, they haven't yet taken the, the step of becoming full voting participants and uh, contributing uh, funds to the operation of our activities. And there are, there are institutions and citizen science groups in many other countries that are also publishing data uh, independently of any uh, national uh, engagement. And on top of that, a number of uh, international organizations that have an interest in biodiversity data are also uh, participants in our network and help us with uh, establishing vision and directions. The main aim of what we're doing uh, is to serve as a, a set of tools and processes that will help all the different uh, holders and sources of biodiversity information to make what they have available so that it can be discovered in a unified way and used for a wide range of different uh, scientific and, and societal purposes. To that end, uh, the three roles I see as really fundamental to our activity. First of all, to remove any obstacles that are limiting that kind of data sharing that was shown on the previous slide. Some of these are technical, but relatively few of them. The technical side is, is usually not the big problem. The much bigger problems are around finding ways that uh, we can overcome either issues around openness uh, for data sharing, uh, or else overcoming the kind of challenges around standardizing standards uh, and making metadata consistent uh, for people to be able to, uh, to trust and make use of others, each other's information. The other two uh, primary roles are the ones that um, I've already touched on in my, my opening comments, that organizing what evidence we have from different sources of the recorded occurrence of any species in time and space, uh, and lastly, supporting the development of a global virtual natural history collection. Wherever we have uh, specimens of plants and animals uh, in collections around the world, uh, my vision would be that in the future a, a taxonomist or somebody working in one of those institutions uh, online could pull up images and sequences and measurements from uh, specimens all over the world that may relate to a group that they're studying. And to use that as a means to accelerate uh, our description uh, and our understanding of the, the history of, of life on this planet. We've touched on a lot of these, uh, these acronyms and things already. Um, I just wanted to, to wave the flag and emphasize that GBIF sees itself very much as an open data infrastructure. Uh, the data in our network, uh, we try to make sure that as much data as possible is uh, available under a Creative Commons Zero, CC Zero license, in other words, effectively public domain. But we try to make sure that uh, all use of the data follows a practice that is equivalent to CC BY, that attribution is given. Uh, we do have a small amount that remains in the network that is under a non-commercial attribution license, uh, but that's more of a, what I hope is a short-term uh, stage uh, while we recognize the fact that certain institutions in their own, um, in their own uh, establishment uh, do not really have permission to give their data away uh, in a fully open fashion. Uh, we make sure that everything is, uh, is attached to a digital object identifier so that it's easily cited. Uh, if you download uh, data from the GBIF network, you will get a DOI for your downloads so that you can cite it and we can track back to all of the uh, associated sources of the data and give them feedback uh, on how their information has been uh, reported, uh, been used. Uh, and you see FAIR again and uh, WDS and the Research Data Alliance uh, as, as key partners. We're trying to apply these approaches uh, to bring together information from any source uh, that can tell us something about a particular species, uh, generally at the species level in some cases, uh, the identification may be at a higher rank or there may be no uh, formal name for the species in question. Uh, the location, the date, 
Uh, what is the evidence for this? Is there a specimen sitting in a collection? Are there images? Are there recordings? Uh, is this based on uh, molecular data? Uh, so there is uh, an ability to evaluate uh, the, the credibility of data, although doing that uh, at the scale of hundreds of millions of records is still a challenge for researchers that we're, we're looking to try to automate. Uh, and that means that we're, we're bringing in data, particularly from natural history collections and citizen science, uh, but also um, I would expect from, well, certainly already from animal tracking and sequences and literature, but in the future also I'm expecting a certain proportion for uh, canopy trees and uh, large, uh, large vertebrates uh, from remote sensing uh, and the ability to uh, recognize taxa from space. At present, this is the, uh, the global distribution of the data points within GBIF. Uh, a, a lack uh, in most of Asia and parts of Africa especially. Uh, very high densities of data from countries that have a strong tradition of citizen science uh, and, and open data. Uh, but uh, if you compare this with the views of GBIF from a few years ago, even the former Soviet Union and China we're starting to see a lot more data publishing coming through. Uh, and uh, we have extensive activities uh, to build capacity in different countries and to promote uh, involvement in the GBIF network. Uh, and in fact, just today, uh, we've received a formal application from uh, South Sudan uh, to become a GBIF participant. So the network is growing uh, and uh, more and more data uh, is being published uh, all the time. Some of you may, be, uh, may have a perception of GBIF that perhaps reflects the situation a few years ago where the only data that ever appeared in GBIF was uh, evidence of actual recorded presence. Uh, a species had been found, but we never carried information stating that a survey had looked for a species and not found it or um, anything that uh, helped you to evaluate the relative presence of species in a particular location. Uh, for the last few years, uh, we've extended our data standards so that we also capture information on uh, field protocols, uh, sampling events, and uh, relative abundance within those samples, which means even absence data can be represented in the network now. Uh, and for all sources where uh, perhaps they've, they've had to downgrade the quality of their data to make it accessible in GBIF, uh, we're working with them to try to encourage them to expose uh, more of the actual richness of the data. And quite clearly, if you go back to uh, the kind of questions I was talking about earlier uh, in, in terms of the ability to compare the state of biodiversity in different times and places, uh, in theory, with significant enough quantities of bulk uh, presence data, uh, we can simulate uh, some of those patterns, uh, especially if the, the volumes get big enough. Uh, but uh, realistically, this is the gold standard uh, for making those kinds of, of comparisons. And obviously that allows us, um, as we move forward, uh, to, to, to start thinking about better visualizations of, of some of what's actually happening uh, with these data. Um, overall, um, I think the, the greatest challenge I see uh, is, is, again, a societal one. Uh, and this, this reflects what's easy to do with computers as opposed to what really needs uh, human intervention and very friendly software to assist uh, users a, in helping us to curate the data. This is, this is perhaps a slightly pessimistic but not unrealistic view of, of what can happen today. Um, the, a, a curator down on the bottom left uh, might digitize a specimen, in this case the, the little beetle, the weevil, uh, shown next to the museum at the bottom. Uh, and they may initially identify this as, as some species and the record may go out to the wider world. Uh, some people may detect the fact that the coordinates don't really fall within Germany and so they may or may not use the record because of that depending on how good they are at spotting these things. They may even realize the coordinates are switched and, and corrected. But none of that information necessarily flows back uh, to the, uh, the original source database. Uh, and if somebody then comes in and re-identifies this, this insect, uh, that information isn't going to be visible necessarily to anybody who's used 
this information in the past, even though it's completely irrelevant, potentially, to the questions they were trying to address. And this is an enormous challenge that reflects uh, the data management practices we have today. That, uh, in, in effect, what GBIF is doing is allowing everybody who is collecting and managing species data to put out a copy every so often for us to collect up and organize into a single discoverable view. There's, it's much harder for, uh, for us to anchor annotations and corrections on those data as they continually get revised and rebuilt. Uh, and realistically, we need to find a way to get closer to a model like this, where uh, what we have, uh, regardless of how the data are, are, are hosted in repositories and databases around the world, where it functions as a fully interconnected linked open data space, where everybody who has comments or corrections or additional information that they wish to provide in regard to anything in our data space uh, is able to do so. And again, as I was suggesting for a, a future replacement for the taxonomic literature, we have a digital resource that continues to improve and represent more and more closely both our understanding of the, the state of biodiversity and hopefully approximate more closely uh, the reality of that state and how it's changed. So most of the things that wake me up at night, they don't keep me awake all night, but wake me up at night uh, are to do with how we get closer to making uh, the digital space one where curators and, and, and so any researcher who is using data can actually um, and actively help us to improve it over time. I have another thing, um, this isn't anywhere nearly as exciting as going to Botswana, um, uh, but uh, six years ago, GBIF held a conference that delivered this document, uh, the Global Biodiversity Informatics Outlook. It, it, GBIF and uh, a range of other biodiversity informatics initiatives partnering together uh, with funding from multiple sources. And the goal of this was to, um, to, to, to have researchers, uh, informaticians, uh, policymakers and funders think about the landscape of biodiversity informatics. That includes the sort of things that GBIF's doing, the sort of things the Barcode of Life is doing, uh, the catalogue of life in trying to organise names and classifications of species, trying to organise trait data uh, as the Encyclopedia of Life and others are doing, and putting all of these things together in a way that could support uh, intelligent modeling of species distributions and trends, uh, even making predictions about changes in biodiversity, understanding the functioning of ecosystems, and also providing a feedback for us to prioritize future research and data capture. Uh, and, and this document came up with uh, a number of component areas that it identified as being really important uh, for greater collaboration and use. And in the following six years, we've made progress in some of those areas. Uh, I would say that a lot of those areas of progress have been a side effect of the fact that over the same period, there's been a lot more focus at the uh, national and regional level in many areas around open data and tools for managing open data, the sort of uh, things that, uh, that Simon and, and Bill have already talked about. But it's still very hard for us to coordinate as fully as I would like. Much of the money that comes into uh, data management for biodiversity is at the scale of very small to medium-sized at most projects. Perhaps at the upper end, most projects are 100, 200,000 euros, um, and, and many are much, much smaller. And for activities such as these, to try to fit into a bigger global picture of how their data get reused uh, and don't disappear, blown to the winds, as Simon has mentioned, is really difficult. And doing that at the kind of scale we would need if we really do want to describe all of the world's biodiversity and be able to represent that, the patterns in biodiversity across the whole planet at a good scale, to achieve that, we need a lot more coordination. So this year, uh, we're having a, another conference uh, in a few months' time where we're going to bring together a rather similar audience, but the goal here is instead to think about 
how we could establish a coordination mechanism for doing these things. Um, my vision for this is that uh, probably a very small project office, perhaps two or three people, not even necessarily all sitting in one place, could oversee a series of planning workshops which would bring together experts from around the world to draft up some candidate priorities for a particular thematic area. Uh, for example, how can we do a better job of mining information out of the digital literature? Or how do we bridge the gap that often still exists between museum-based data and, uh, and molecular data resources? How do we make these things genuinely interoperable? Uh, and that for each of the areas that un for which we undertook this, the goal would be to come up with a shopping list of priorities that we'd like to see addressed over the coming five to ten year period. Perhaps some of those may, may be calling for workshops to deal with some standards related issues. Or um, at another scale, it may be uh, calling for uh, some investment in a global data integration point for some kind of category of data uh, or some kind of modeling uh, solutions. And from that shopping list to encourage stakeholders throughout the world at whatever scale, whether they're just a, a museum or some, some university uh, or an entire national data center, to, to seek funding to implement those priorities as part of a more shared vision and to get some letters of support, etc., and uh, in kind or practical support from around the world to achieve those things as part of a bigger picture. I do think this is uh, essential for us if we are going to become more effective at using the, the not insignificant but completely inadequate amounts of money uh, that are available uh, for providing uh, solutions to all of this. So that's, that's a quick overview of, of some of where GBIF is and some of where we're going. Um, I, I think it's, it's an exciting situation because we have a lot of forward movement that is arising from greater global interest in big data, open data, linked open data, uh, and at the other end, uh, some of the really big um, societal problems and uh, earth-observing issues that we cannot address unless we can provide credible data components uh, to fit into modeling those things. So thank you very much.